another video. I hope you guys are doing fine with these videos and you understand you can pause them and re-listen to them as you need them. I hope they are helpful for you. Um, so moving right along, um, we're still in module five, investigation three for today. Um, so we did four in the last video, three in this video. This is known as transformations of polynomials and then functions and polynomial functions and symmetry. So a transformation means you're changing something. All right, you might be changing just its location. You might be changing its size. And so that's what a transformation is. There's two types of transformations. They're called translations and scale changes, but we'll get into that um, in this section right here. All right, so moving right along, the two types of transformations, so you're transforming something, are translations, in which case you're changing its location. You're moving it right, left, up, down, or a mixture of those. Scale changes, on the other hand, you're changing the size. So you're changing how big it is, making it larger, making it smaller. And so here are some examples of some translations. If your original function is a parabola, y equals x squared, if you all of a sudden take your x and you subtract a 3 from it, whenever you subtract from an x value, it means you're going to move to the right. So this means you're going to the right 3. If you add to an x value, that means you're moving left. So this one here means it's moving to the left Two. So let me make sure you can see this in the form of a graph over here. So what I want to do is I want to start with my original function y equals x squared and then I'm going to put y equals parenthesis x minus 3 and then squared and then the next one I want to put x plus 2 and then parenthesis squared. So like I said, I already knew those because I understand what the plus and minus sign there mean. For some people, they have to take the time to get their calculator out and to go and to graph them so that then they can tell the same thing. So there's the original parabola. The next one I said moved to the right three and the other one moved to the left two. So you can kind of see these have not changed sizes in any way. All they have done is we have taken the original equation, moved it to the right three, moved it left two. All right, so we're going to save that picture there for those first two. Now, what about when the plus and minus doesn't happen to be with the x? What if it is at the end of the equation or at the beginning? A plus that is not directly inside that x with the squared means you're going to move it up. And then a minus, when you see it, means you are going to move it down. Okay, so let's go back to that picture so that you actually believe me. Um, I'm going to keep my original function, clear these other two, and I'm going to put x squared minus 4 here and x squared plus 3 right here. Okay, so that they're in the same order that I have them up there. So we have our original equation, our parabola. Then we move up three for the second one, and we move down four for the next one. Now these here do not actually change sizes, even though they kind of look a little bit like they do. It's just that you can't see as much of it because of the window changing. So they themselves are actually the same size. One is just scooched down from the other one. So there you have an example of what translations are. They take the same exact graph and they change its location. Next we have scale changes, and scale changes change sizes of things. All right, so the scale changes that you are going to see is if the number goes in front of the x squared or the square root or whatever the function is, as opposed to if I had written it like this. Like this means it's with the x. That is not the same thing as what this one over here means. This one here is not with the x. It's not inside that parent of the square right there. So this here means when it's out in front like that, it means it's going to take and change a size. Um, and the four that you see, in fact, it might be just easier to show you the pictures of these. Let me go back. Let me get rid of this guy here and put 4x squared in its place. 
and then get rid of this one and put one fourth. So that's a fraction, one over four, and then my x squared. All right, so here with this one is our original parabola. And with a four in front, do you see how it stretches longer four times? And then a one fourth means the height itself is one fourth, at, you know, what it would have been. Um, so I know that kind of is hard to, well, that's really hard to explain actually without being able to use my arms in front of you. But the four stretches it from this way to this way four times what it would have been. So normally if it was only 10 units high, you know, instead it's going to be like 40 units high, you know, it's going to get stretched that way. That's what the four is talking about. So it's getting skinnier. You can kind of think of that. And the one fourth means it's actually getting fatter. But what's really happening, happening is it's taking and it's being squished, okay, from top to bottom. So when we look at an equation, all right, numbers can be in four different places. They could be multiplied out front. Now, this one here is considered to be multiplied by the x, or this one's considered to be multiplied outside of the x. In which case, if it's outside of it, it's a vertical stretch or shrink. So we, when we put the four out front in place of that last one, it was a vertical stretch. When it was a one-fourth, it was a shrink. So if it's a number bigger than one, it's a stretch. If it's a number smaller than one, it's a shrink, or like a fraction kind of thing. Uh, I should say the absolute value. A horizontal, if the number is with the x, then it's the opposite. If the b value is greater than one, I should say absolute value of it, that means it's going to be a shrink. And if the absolute value of the v value is less than one, and bigger than zero, we're saying, then that means it's going to be a stretch. Where this one here is saying, if A is greater than one, it's a stretch. If A is less than one, it's a shrink. All right, and then the others. If you have a number that's being added, like this C right here, it's a horizontal shift. Um, and as opposed to if it's at the end, then it's a vertical shift. So it shifts left if there's a plus sign, minus if there's a right sign. It shifts up if it's a plus sign, and minus if it's a down sign. Now, we have one last thing, and that is a reflection. If the A value is negative, then it reflects over the x-axis. However, if the B value is negative, it reflects over the y-axis. All right, so these are things you definitely are going to want to know. It's going to, if you know those things, study those things, then it's going to make the problems you do a lot easier, okay? So, for example, if I gave you something like y equals negative 4 times the square root of x plus 2 minus 7, you should be able to give me the following information. That it's moving from its parent y equals the square root of x, it's moving down 7, it's moving to the left two, that it is stretching vertically, and that negative there means it is reflecting over the x-axis. If the negative is inside here with the x, it would be going over the y-axis, but since it's out front there, it's reflecting over the x-axis. Okay, so let's actually take a look at these two functions so that you believe me here. Again, I'm always concerned that you believe me here. Um, here is the parent function, y equals the square root of x. If I type in negative 4 and then square root x plus 2 and then minus 7, let me clear this other guy out of there, and I graph it, there's the parent function. Now, the other is kind of hard to see because it moved down 7. Okay, so let me just change my window so that you can see it. I'm going to go down to maybe like negative 20 just so that you can see it here. Okay. There's the original, and here's the other. It looks larger 
because of the stretch. Remember how it said it stretched it vertically? So it's four times as high as what the other one is. It's reflected over the x-axis, means it completely just, you know, symmetry-wise, just reflects like a mirror does, right over the x-axis. It moved to the left two and it moved down seven. So you can kind of see all of that within that picture right there, which let me just add this in right down here so you have it when you look back later. All right, so let's see. On page 189 in your um, workbook, you guys had a PC question that was this one here. Regal Theater puts on community theater productions each season. After several years of gathering data, they noted some trends between the length of the plays they produced and the number of tickets they sold for Friday evening shows. They created the model shown below. All right, so here we have a model. Notice each of these points. The first point says if the play was one hour long, then they sold 119 tickets. So at one hour, you can see approximately 119 tickets, etc. All the way to where their highest value was, if it was 2.25 hours, then that means they sold their maximum number of tickets, which is 150. But you're also seeing that as the time of this play or show um, gets longer and longer, the fewer tickets that are sold. Because sometimes people, quite honestly, are not interested in going to a show that's a, a long time. They don't like sitting still for that long. It says, what does the ordered pair 3, 139 represent? So here is that point right here, 3, 139. And you should have said something along the lines of, if the show is three hours long, then 139 tickets will be sold. Unless, of course, coronavirus is a problem, then the show will be canceled altogether, right? We can add that in since we have this. Okay, next it says, determine the function's average rate of change. Remember, that was a word from way back when, earlier this year, that refers to slope over the following intervals. Make sure to describe how, in, uh, how to interpret the meaning of the average rate of change in this case. All right, so what's being given here is you are being given two x values, 1 and 2.25. If I look one up in the chart, it's 119. If I look two up in the chart, I get 150. To find the average rate of change, that's the same thing as slope, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x2. This ends up giving me here 31 over 1.25. And when I divide that out, I end up getting 24.8. So my answer here is 24.8, but what does that mean? Think about what you just did. Your X value represents hours. Your Y value represents tickets. As soon as you divided these, you took number of tickets divided by number of hours, okay? So for this right here, it's you will sell 24.8 tickets for every hour that the show lasts. Now that there is only talking about, oh goodness, let me back that up. Hold on, my things aren't lined up anymore. It's talking about what the slope is from these two points right here. That does not represent this entire graph. It only represents from a time of 1 to 2.25. So from a time of 1 to 2.25 hours, The show will sell, oops, boop, boop, at a rate of 24.8 tickets per hour, per hour that the show is. OK, 
Okay, so that's a positive slope on that side over there. Now, the next question that is going to be asked is the same kind of question. Find the average rate of change from 2.5 to 4. All right, well, at a time of 2.5, we sold, I'm just getting this from the chart, 149 tickets. And at a time, if it's four hours long, I'm going to sell 89 tickets. And so again, the average rate of change, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This here ends up giving me um, negative 40. Well, how can I sell negative tickets? It's just saying that you won't sell as many tickets. The rate is decreasing, okay? So we would get negative 40 tickets per hour. And again, this is the rate that shows the longer the show goes, the longer the show lasts. Forty less tickets per hour of show will be sold. And this is true. This is very true that, you know, um, if you're in New York City, other than right now with all the shows canceled, um, they understand that if they have a show on Broadway that lasts, say, you know, two and a half hours, they're going to sell a nice amount of tickets. But if the show lasts four hours, they're not going to have as many people buying tickets for it. Does the function have positive concavity or negative concavity? And so these are some new words for you. Concave. So let me give you this. Concave up means something like this. This is what they call positive concavity because it goes up. Concave down looks like this. This is what they call negative concavity. Okay. So if the if you compare these, this is the one that this you know, particular situation have, it has negative concavity. And it says, what does this tell you about the situation? And again, that's exactly what we were saying up above is that, you know, it increases at first and then it decreases once it gets to a certain time. That's all you need to know. There won't be any questions on the test about concavity, so you don't really need to worry about that. Next, here we now have Regal Theater. Contacted a similar theater um, in another city that's called Player Productions. Player Productions said their model was virtually identical to the model created by Regal Theater. The only difference is that they sold 30 fewer tickets each Friday night compared to Regal Theater. Complete the table of values of Player Productions model. So this right here, if they sold 30 fewer tickets, that means you would need to take and take the exact chart that we were just looking at and subtract 30. So the chart that we were looking at before, I'll just put these numbers on here real quick so that it's easy for you to refer to them because I know that these are on the other side of the page. You would actually have to flip your paper. Oh my goodness. Okay, this is what it was at Regal Theater. At Player Productions, they sold 30 less. So you're going to take and subtract 30. Now, why did they sub why did they sell 30 less? Less. Maybe their theater is smaller than the other theater. You know, there are reasons why these things happen. So we have to look into it not because it's not as good of a show, but because maybe the theater itself just can't hold that many. So their numbers would look like this: 89. 109, 115, subtract 30 from this one, I get 119, 120, 119, 109, uh, I feel like I did that already, 89, and then 59, okay? So this is complete the table, so there you have it. Then it says describe how the outputs of function G and H compare to any X input value. So what we did right here is we took each of the functions, which they were called g in the other one, we took all of the g of x's, these were the g of x's right here, 
and these are the h of x's over here. So do you see how h of x is the same thing as taking the g of x minus 30? So there you have yourself how to compare the two of those. Then it says draw a graph of h on the axis given in exercise 1. All right, so we're going to go back over to this one here. Let me erase the stuff I have on here. And I'm going to take and I am going to go down by 30 for each one of these. Now remember, it went to 89. So this one here is going to be right here. Oh, wait, that's not 89. That's 99. I'm going to go to 89 right about there. And then I might take this high point here. I'm going to go 109. I 109 for this one. The next one is 115. Maybe about there. And then the next one is 119. That's a little bit higher right in there. Oops, sorry. That's supposed to be over here. Two point. Okay, two. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, they didn't give me these exact things. It was 1, 1 1.5. The next one was 1.75. 1.75 should have been there. And then 2 is at 119. And then... Something doesn't make sense there. 3, or 2.25 is in between these, is at 120. And then... 2.5 is at 119 right here, and then 3 is at 109, which is right even with that other one over there, and then 3.5 is at 89, which is the same as that guy over there, and then 4 is at 59, which is right about there. So if I would take and plot those points and connect them, you can see that this here is just translated down 30 units. So it was a translation. And that's probably what the next question is going to ask, going back to the real problem. How does the average rate of change of H on the intervals from 1 to 2.25 and 2.5 to 4 compare to the average rate of change on those other intervals? They're talking slope here. All right, so let's go back to that problem and let's look. Do you remember how a little bit ago... I took and said, we took this point and we took this point and we found the slope right there. Well, if I take those same two points down here, what do you notice? See how the slope is the same? So for this one right here, these are exactly the same because they have the same slope. The graph didn't change sizes. It only changed location, so the slopes are the same. Then it says, ex use function notation to express the outputs of h of x in terms of the outputs of g of x. Oh, wow, maybe that's not what they wanted up on that other one right there. We have this answer up in part B. I guess that's not what they wanted. Describe how the outputs of g and h compared to any input value. Um, for that right there and that's I gave that same exact answer even in my book um, seeing if you were making that so you can use the same answer for both of those right there all right so now we have several slides like this right here where we're actually taking and um, taking a function so this the function that's given is f of x and it's asking you to plus one at the end this means to move it up one unit so what you could do is you could do a couple of things, okay? First of all, you could write down the important points of this right here. And I wouldn't necessarily do this on this particular problem, but <coughs> as we get to some more difficult problems, I want you to see, you know, kind of what's going on. All right, so starting with the point on the left, it is negative 2, negative 4. And then the next point is the point 2, 4. And then the next point is the point 3, 2. And then we have the point um, 4, 2. Okay, these are your points on f of x itself. Well, in order to find g of x, I need to take f of x and I need to add 1 to it. 
Now, since this is moving up one, that means what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one to each of these y values. So my new point will be negative two, negative three, because negative four plus one. This one here, I add one to this, and I get positive two, five. And then for this one, I add one to that, I get three, three. And then for this one, I add one to it, four, three. And so from here, I go to the left two, and I go down three, and I have that point. I go to the right two, I go up five, I have that point. So what you're seeing right here as I connect these things is they are all moving up one. Every point along that line moves up one. All right, then from there, the next point is three, three. And so that connects, it stays above it there. And then four, three, and I have that. So you can see that each of these are moved up one unit from the previous um, one. Of course, could I just have taken each point and just moved it up one? Yes, you can. That would be the easy way to do it on this one. I wanted to show you with the points because there will be some later that do get more difficult. The next one is saying move every point down one. So in which case, really what you're doing is you're taking the points, you're taking the y values, and you're subtracting one. So this point here is going to move to here. This point here is going to move to here. This point's going to move here. We need another one here. This point's going to move to there. So what you're going to see is the same kind of thing. Of course, that's showing you the easier way without using the points. Can you do that? Yes, for sure. Uh, but again, on some of the more difficult ones, you won't be able to. Now, this one here, what does it mean? It means to move everything up four units. So if you're going to take and move up four units, this is your original function f of x. Again, I'm going to show you with points um, because I, I think it's important for some problems that are coming up. Your first point there is negative 4, negative 2, and then you have negative 3, and then positive 2, and then you have 2, 2, and then you have 3, 3, and then you have 5, 1. Okay? G of x, we're going to take and add 4 to the y values because it's moving up 4. So as I take and I add 4 to each of these y values right here, notice all of my x values right now are staying the same. But I end up with 2, 6, 6, 7, and 5. I could go and plot each of these. Negative 4 and then up 2 is this point right here. Negative 3 and then up 6 is right about here. Make sure I get them right. Um, 2 and then up 6 is right here. 3 and then 7 is right there. And 5, 5 is right there. Okay, so we have this graph right here that is moved. So that's how you can move it one point at a time. Of course, what you're doing is you're taking the entire thing and just translating it up four. This one here is down four. Of course, one, two, three, four. I could just say, okay, it's moving down like that. But it's not a bad idea to find like a point on it. Like this one here is the point two, four. That means if I have the point 2, 4, and I want to move it down 4, it's now going to be at 2, 0. Because you do need to take and make these the same size. And so that right there is going to be helpful in making you do it. Parabolas, curved things are a little more difficult to actually move. Okay, so that's where points are one place that they come in handy. Here is the other place, when you have a number being multiplied out front, okay? So this takes us back to our original problem we had on the first slide of these. Um, my f of x is made up of the points negative 2, negative 4, um, 2, 4, 3, 2, and 4, 2. And the 1 half is saying multiply the y values by one half. 
So that gives me negative, or sorry, one half times negative four is going to be negative two for that. And then four times one half is going to be two for that. And then the x's are all staying the same here, by the way. They just happen to be the same right there. Two times one half is one for there. And then two times one half is again one for there. So negative two, negative two is right here. Two, two is right here. Three, one, and four, one. Now check out what just happened to this guy. Do you see how the original graph went from positive four to negative four? It was eight units long. But this new one we just had goes from positive two to negative two. It's four units long. Do you see how this is half of what this value is? So that's where giving the points makes it easier. It would be difficult to find where those points are if you did if you weren't able to use the point system here, you know, like finding the points and, and maneuvering it. All right, this one here is saying take all the um, x values or the y values and multiply by two. So again, let's start with these points. We have the point negative 4, negative 2, and negative 3, 2. Whoops, I didn't line those up very good. 2, 2, 3, 3, and 5, 1. And I'm going to multiply the y's by 2 this time. And that is going to give me what g of x is. All right, all of the x's here so far staying the same. Multiply all the y's by 2. So negative 4, 4, 4, 6, 2. And plot them. So here we have negative 4, negative 4. I guess I need a little, needs to go down a little bit more there. Negative 4, negative 4. Negative 3, positive 4 is way up here. And positive 2, positive 4. 3, positive 6 and five positive two. So let's see what's happening with this guy. I connect all of these. Do you see how my original graph went up here from three all the way down here to negative two? It was five units long. Well, this new graph is going from six up here all the way down to negative four. Do you see how it's 10 units long? Do you see how it's double? Okay, that's what that 2 times the y values is referring to. Um, this is actually the same exact problem. It's just that the graph is different. All right, so let's find some points on this one. f of x has the point 0, 0. We know that. It also has the point 2, 4. A negative 2, 4. And then it looks like it has the point, is 3 able to, kind of hard to tell for sure on that. Let's just use those three points. So that means I'm going to take my y values and multiply by 2. So all of my x values are staying the same, but when I multiply them by 2, I get 0, I get 2 times 4 is 8, and I get 2 times 4, which is 8 again. So my new one is going 0, 0, 2, all the way up to 8, and negative 2 all the way up to 8. So you can see what's happening. Whoa, that's really ugly. Is It's getting skinnier. It's getting close to that uh, y-axis there. And isn't that what happens when we multiply by a 2 out front? It's a vertical stretch of 2. So it stretches that, makes it skinny. All right, so here we go. We get the good ones now. This one here is saying, what happens if you have 1 half f of x and then minus 2? So there's two things happening right here. All right, so for this right here, what we're going to do is we're going to start with our points from our f of x. Okay. 
After we apply the f of x, then we're going to apply the scale change, which is the one-half f of x. And then we're going to do the one-half f of x minus 2. So we're going to kind of do this in phases. All right, so I need my points again, these four points. I keep looking at the same graph. Um, negative 2, negative 4, 2, 4. 3, 2, and 4, 2, okay? 1 half f of x means I'm going to take the y values and multiply them by a half. So all of my x values here are staying the same, and I'm multiplying these by half. So half of negative 4 is negative 2. Half of 4 is 2. Half of 2 is 1, and half of 2 is 1, all right? Now from here, that part's already done. I now need to subtract 2 from each of my um, y values. So when I subtract 2 now from each of my y values, I get negative 2 minus 4. I get negative, or positive 2, sorry. And then 2 minus 2 is 0. And then 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And then 4 minus 2 is negative 1. So you're going to do this in steps, but these then are your final graph. Negative 2, positive 4 is right there. 2, 0, right there. 3, negative 1. And then 4, negative 1. And so from this right here, I, have, I must have a mistake on something right there. Because it's not the same shape. It has to be this guy right over here. This one. Okay, I see my mistake. I didn't plot the point right. It's supposed to be negative 2, negative 4, which is down here. All right, so here we go. I have this. And what this is showing right here is that this thing right here is now only 4 units long where before it was 8 units long. And in addition to that as well, um, it looks like it was moved down 2. So uh, the down 2 is kind of hard to see with that in that particular instance. Okay, so you want to first apply the scale change, change the size of it, and then change its location. And that's exactly what we actually did there. All right. Um, same thing for this one here. Let's get these points right here on our paper first. We have negative 5, negative 2. This is our original f of x function. Then we have negative 3, 2. We have 2, 2. We have 3, 3. And then we have 5, 1. Okay, next we're going to multiply each of our y values by 2. So I have all my x values staying the same. Multiply each of my y values by 2, I get negative 4, 4, 4, 6, and 2. Then from there, I'm going to move them all down 1. So now I'm going to subtract 1 from the y values. Again, all of my x values are staying the same. Subtract 1 from each of these, giving me negative 5. 4 minus 1 is 3. 4 minus 1 is 3. 6 minus 1 is 5. And 2 minus 1 is 1. All right, now I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to take, and I'm going to plot each of these. So negative 5, negative 5, I need to extend this just a little bit. Here's negative 5, negative 5 is right down there. Negative 3, positive 3 is going to be up here. 2, 3 is right there. 3, 5 is right about there. And 5, 1 is right about there. So here you can see the general shape is the same, 
but it has been stretched out. It's longer, it's twice as long as what the original one was. The original one was four units long. This one is now, oh, well, maybe it was five units long. Down three, uh, down two, up to three. Five units long, now it's 10 units long. And then from there, each one was moved down one from that original stretch. Again, we have this one here that has the points for f of x as 0, 0, uh, 1, or no, I think it was 2. I think it was 1, 1, 2, 3, what was it? 2, 4, I think it was. And that means negative 1, 1, and negative 2, negative 4, or positive 4, sorry. I think I only used three of those points before. We're going to take the y values and multiply the y values, so half of the y value for this column. And then after we do that, we're going to subtract 3 from the y column. All right, so half of the y value. That means all of the x values, again, are staying the same. And I'm taking half of the y values. Half of 0 is 0. Half of 1 is <coughs> half. Half of 4 is 2. Half of 1 is 1 half. Half of 4 is 2. All right, now from there, we're going to subtract 3 from each y value. So again, the x values are staying the same. Um, subtracting 3, 0 minus 3 is negative 3. 1 half minus 3 is negative 2 and a half. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. 1 half minus 3 is negative 2 and a half again. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So when I go and I graph this right here, I get 0, negative 3. I get 1, negative 2 and a half. I get 2, negative 1. And then I get negative 1, negative 2 and a half, and negative 2, negative 1. Here I have this right here. And what I can see is how tall it used to be, it is kind of pushed down. Remember, the 1 half out front means it's getting fatter, and the minus 3 means it's moving down 3. All right, so that was all of those for moving them um, stretching them vertically or shrinking vertically or uh, moving um, up or down. But now we have to look at some problems where what if instead the numbers with the x value? Okay, this right here when you have x plus 3 means it's moving to the left 3. It means you actually have to do the opposite. You have to subtract 3 from the x values. Okay. So if my original points, these are the ones that are a little more confusing. If my original points are negative 5, negative 2, um, negative 3, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 5, 1, and now I'm going to take and subtract 3 from the x values, that means all of my y values are staying the same this time. And so to subtract 3, negative 5 minus 3 means minus 8. Negative 3 minus 3 means minus 6. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. 3 minus 3 is 0. 5 minus 3 is 2. Now let's go plot these points over here. I get negative 8, which it doesn't quite go over to. There's 6, 7, 8. It's going to be right over here on the edge. Negative 8, negative 2. Negative 6, positive 2. Negative 1, 2. 0, 3. 2, 1. So you can see that this thing stayed the same size. It just moved to the left 3. So whenever the number is with the x, if it says plus, you have to do the opposite, which is minus. 
So that's something to kind of, you know, write on your paper. You know, X's are always opposite. Plus two means subtract two. If it's multiplied by five, divide by five. <laughs> You know, everything is opposite with your X's when you do these problems. So here's another one that has both numbers. Where there's one with the X and there's one with the Y. So this here means it's moving to the right one. And this one means it's moving up one. Well, can you do that on this without the points? Absolutely. Take this point, move it to the right one and up right one, you'd be right there. Take this point, move it to the right one and up one, you'd be right there. This point, move it to the right one and up one, you'd be right there. Move right one, up one, you'd be right about there. Move to the right one and up one on that last point, you'd be right about there. You can connect them and you can get your graph. Okay, so if you can do it that way, go ahead and do it that way. But some of you won't be able to. You'll need the individual points on some of the homework problems. A third theater company. So we're back to that theater company. And this here is number three. It is on page 190. I didn't put the page number there. Sorry about that. A third theater company called Actors Guild House found a similar trend. However, they sell one and a half times as many tickets to their Friday shows compared to the Regal Theater. So remember the Regal Theater. It was the one that had the 119, the 139, etc. I'm going to write those on here real quick so you can see where I'm getting my numbers from. And 1.5 times means multiply each of these by 1.5 the whole way down. And when you do, you end up getting a new set of values. That means you're stretching this thing. It's getting bigger. These numbers are going to be larger. 178.5, 208.5. You could pause the video and try to get these numbers on your own and then take and look to see how you do. All right, so there is completing the table. Now it says describe how the outputs of the functions g and f compare to any input value. So from this right here, I could say, you know, remember this here was, oh goodness, was that called h of x on that? It was called g of x. This is g of x times 1.5 equals our f of x. So we could come up with that equation. Our f of x is equal 1.5 times our g of x. You could also say things like, you know, from here to here, the numbers are increasing, you know, or have a positive slope. From here to here, they have a negative slope. Can you draw this on the graph of example one? All right, well, let's go find it. That was a little while ago here. Let's go back to that graph. Is this it right here? All right. I'm going to have to choose another color. I'll choose this fuchsia color right here. It says at 1, it should be at 178.5, which we'll call right about there. At 1.5, it should be at 208, which would be yeah, somewhere right about in there. 217.5 for this one, so maybe right about in there. And then 223.5 when it's 2, so it's going to go right above, right there. And then 225 at 2.25, so that maybe will go right about there. And then at 2.5, it's on 223.5, back down to here. And now we're coming back down 208.5. That's at 3, right? Yeah right about there, and then 178.5 when it's at 3.5, and then when it's at 4, it's 133.5, which is woo way down here, 133.5, right about there. 
So again, we can connect these, and what we're going to find is it's parallel to it, okay? It did take and it stretched it, you know, a little bit more. It's not just a translation, but look at how this here is longer from here to here than what this is from here to here. It might not be so easy to see initially, but then when you take, oh, I was hoping I could move those values right there. Let me do this. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. When I take that and move it up here, you can see that it's longer than what the original one was. Okay. Actually, I think that last point ended up here. Let me redraw that one because it would really be from here up to here. That might be a better picture to show you. See how it's like one and a half times what that width is right there. All right, so coming back down to this one here, how does the average rate of change on the intervals change for this? Um, and, you know, again, you could find the slope and compare them. I, I don't think we need to go through that again. I think some of these other things that we have left are a little more important. All right, so here is on page 191 in your book. Um, it's number five. It says the graph of H is given. Draw the graph of G. All right, so look what G is. G has a negative out front, which means it's reflected over the x-axis. And then this plus 3 means to then move it to the left 3. Okay, so we're going to take this thing and reflect it first. So this part that's below the x-axis, I'm going to reflect up above like this. I'm going to kind of come down. This part here that's coming up above the x-axis is going to take and come down, and then it's going to kind of go up like that. That's just a reflection. It's just flipping it over that, okay? Then from there, I'm going to take this and move all of this to the left three units. And so that means this here that's crossing right here, it's now going to go one, two, three. It's going to be over to there, okay? So it's not moving up or down at all. It's just moving to the left. I was hoping I could move that all at once, but it didn't quite let me, but that's okay. I could do this. So that is what your final answer should look like. For that one. Now, I have a little note here. Many of the functions we've worked with in this module and that we will continue to work with in the next few investigations are not all quadratics. They're polynomial functions. Polynomial functions is where we'll go in the next few sections as well. Polynomials are anything like this negative 5x to the 6 plus 13x squared. It doesn't mean that the exponent is a 2. It means the exponent is a number that's a whole number. Okay, it has to be a positive whole number. So here is another example of a polynomial function. It has x's and numbers. It has plus signs and minus signs, but all of the exponents have to be positive. Our quadratic functions, which are our parabolas, they and linear functions are also examples of polynomials. So we start with those, but then we start looking at more curves and such, right? Next, on page 192, number six, it says define each function in terms of the other, all right? So G is the dotted function, and F is the solid function here. It says express the outputs. Do you see that you could just take and reflect one of them over the x-axis and it becomes the other one? Now, I don't know if this is going to let me do it, but I'm surely going to try. Okay. I do have a feature that I can use that takes and reflects something. Um, let's see if it will do, 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 flip it. That's the one I want. Up and down. Boom. All right. Of course, I'm going to have to move it down low. Do you see how that function becomes that function? It's just a reflection over the x-axis right there. So it says express the output. So we could say g of x equals negative f of x because it reflected over the x-axis. Okay? But can't I also, so now this will really blow your mind, can I also take and flip it from left to right? 
and see how it's then the same function as well. So if you, fl if you flip it from x <laughs> left to right, you could say g of x also is f of negative x. This means reflect over the y-axis. So this here can be reflected over the x-axis or over the y-axis. It happens to be the same graph. Okay. Now, what about this next one right here? This one here from f to g, it looks like it moves down 1, 2, oh, wait, wait, where is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it moves down 7. And then it moves to the right 2. These are going by 2s, I think those numbers say. And to the right 2. Okay, so how can I take and express that? Because g of x is not equal to f of x, but can I write it so that they are? All right, well, down 7 means you would need to take, um, making sure that that's, I'm writing that right, yeah. Down 7 goes at the end. Now, write 2 means minus 2. Okay, so g of x takes f, moves it down 7 and to the right 2. Then it says, can you express f in terms of g? Well, in order to go from g to f, I would have to then go up 7 and to the left 2. And so up 7 and to the left 2, I'm going to say x plus 2 in there. Remember, anything with the x, you have to do as an opposite. And that's the thing that gets so confusing, and that's why you want to actually take and practice. Make sure you're doing the homework on these so that you get them in time for the test. Next, for part C, um, it has two functions, f and g. It looks like they are reflected, but then it looks like from this point to this point, um, going from f to g, it looks like if you're changing f into g, you would have to go to the left 4 and up 6. Or going in the other direction, you'd have to go to the right 4 and down 6. So it just depends. And then reflected over the x-axis. Reflect over x-axis. Either way. Okay. I suppose it could be g, but... All right, so it says express G in terms of F. All right, so what would I have to do to F in order to get to G? Well, I would have to first reflect it over the x-axis. So I'm going to put the negative out in front here. Then I would have to take and move it to the left 4. So that's x plus 4 and up 6, plus 6. Now, how can I write a function for F? Well, reflect G over the x-axis, move it to the right 4, and move it down 6. Okay, so again, those can get really confuse, confusing. Now it says in part D, which of the functions in parts A through C could be polynomial functions? All right, well, part C here definitely is a polynomial function. Part B, is that a polynomial function? Part A, is that a polynomial function? Well, polynomial functions are very curvy in nature. So that would make A and C are two polynomials. Um, the other one is called an absolute value equation. And it um, has like extra symbols, like an absolute value in it. So any square roots, absolute values, that sort of thing, they are not polynomials. All right, that is enough, I think, for investigation four in module five. So before the next video, make sure you complete homework 36, which is over M5I3. And then before you watch the next video, also make sure you do PC26, which is M5I5. Please remember, as you have questions, you know, use the forum to help ask the questions. I definitely will be watching that. Um, and, you know, especially since we went online now, you know, I'll be watching that a little more closely. So, good luck. Hope you're staying healthy.